Hello. Yeah. So, welcome you all again to the Institute uh, Lecture Series and the Institute Talk by Dr. Koenra Sir. Uh, many of you are familiar with his work. He is a very eminent uh, historian, philologist, uh, orientologist, as And he got his PhD uh, <coughs> from the Catholic University of Newman, but he spent some time as a student uh, in Varanasi. So he has a long connection with India, and of course his works are on India. And uh, he was also praised very heavily, very highly by uh, Sitaram Goel, no less uh, Sitaram Goel. Um, so he has some opinions which is not the mainstream. So there are a lot of criticisms, etc., on his work. It is okay. Academic uh, discussion can happen. Criticism can happen as long as it's civil. So we will hear uh, one such uh, theme today from him, or one, one such uh, theme today from him, which is an out of India, the necessary alternative to the Aryan invasion theory. As many of you know, the Aryan invasion theory is what has been taught in schools across India, the value of people know Aryan came, etc. They will uh, explain. There is an alternate theory, which is out of India theory, which you will explain. And so Dr. Hills uh, has been also prolific in writing. He has more than 20 books. Uh, some of his uh, most popular uh, or interesting books include Decolonizing the Hindu Mind, The Sacral Swastika, Hindu Dharma and Culture World, Why and How Mohandas Gandhi Was Killed, Ayodhya Ram Temple, on, I mean, on Ayodhya Ram Temple, the Aryan Indian debate, of course, and Nation is the Indian uh, History Discourse, etc. Et so with this, I uh, request and uh, welcome to the response. I think it can be shown that 
that not how it went. Um, so there is a method called comparative historical linguistics, and I'm not going to talk about the details of that, but it allows you to study similar languages and find how they descend from a common ancestor. And it also allows to show that other languages may not be related if they belong to a different family. <coughs> Now, some people in India don't like this whole idea because this, uh, these, these language families cut through borders. And so, if you have a nationalist obsession with uniformity, with India speaking one language, then this might disappoint you. You see, it means that some parts of India have something in common with some countries outside India and that they do not have in common with other parts of India. And so, the Dravidian and Munda languages and the Tibeto Burman languages and uh, language isolates like Kutunda and Nali um, are not included. They have, of course, been very heavily influenced by Sanskrit, but they are not related to Sanskrit. Uh -huh. And so they say, oh, this is a colonial concoction to divide the rule. It is racist. Man, that's where that should be a lot of time. Now, this just doesn't apply. You see, nobody is denying that the colonial period was poisoned by intense, vicious racism. And yet, that doesn't explain this uh, development of this linguistic theory. Indeed, you see, the first language family that was mapped, that was linguistically analyzed, was this Uralic family, which means Finnish, Hungarian, Estonian, and some minor languages spoken in Russia. All the people concerned are white. The scholars who researched it were white, and so on. there was no relation between concern, there was no colonialism involved, you know, this was just science. Uh, by contrast, you know, it is quite possible that such uh, research is marked by racism. Like uh, the question of the Afro-Asiatic family, which includes Arabic, Hebrew, ancient Egyptian, but also Omotic, Shavi, and a number of other African languages. And so there is a theory, the usual theory is that they went from the Middle East down to Africa. This is a familiar scenario of the enterprising, you know, capable white people penetrating in the territory of indolent blacks who could never do such a thing. Whereas, if the I study this, this particular language family with an Italian professor uh, who had the theory that no, no, the, the homeland is in the upper Nile in Ethiopia there. And then they came up north and they became the Jews and the Arabs and so on. Anyway, that's, that's the subject. So that's where you see how race can be evolved. And we will see that in the 19th century it was also present in the case of the reconstruction of the European, but no longer is today. Right, um, if you don't believe that Sanskrit is related to Greek and not to Tamil, then you see, I may say anything I want, but you may say, oh yeah, the Westerners are prejudiced and racist and they don't understand anything of India anyway. So I point you to the work of Shikan uh, So he has explained it in terms uh, fit for Indian uh, ears and eyes. And so he again shows. Sanskrit is cognate to Latin, but it has influenced Tamil. That's why in Tamil you find many Tatsana words, words literally quoted from Sanskrit, or also Tatsahala words, words that have evolved from Sanskrit origin, like the Kant's name Chetia, comes from Sanskrit Shreti, the rich one. Um, but so that has all been taken over by Sanskrit that was not originally present in Tamil. 
Whereas in Latin, you have the pronouns, the numerals, you see the basic names of powers and body parts and so on. The core of vocabulary is the same in Latin as in Sanskrit. <coughs> what India is is something else, and I like to tell you, it is a so called linguistic area, or Sprachbund, as they call it in your journey. Um, so the Dravidian languages are very different from Sanskrit, but they have absorbed much uh, sounds, uh, grammatical categories, and so on. They also have imparted a few words of their own to Sanskrit like Kami, Yanai, or Nina, meaning fish, or Ila, meaning tooth, or they're from elephant. When you have the Arabic name Siu, which means elephant. Uh, okay, so, um, so the Indian languages have come to resemble each other, like speakers of Gujarati, Marathi, Kamala, and so on, they tell me that for them, you see, learning Hindi is in fact quite easy because you can literally translate a phrase from their language into Hindi or vice versa because these, the, the syntax system, the way that the language functions, has become so similar. So that's what you get in the linguistic area. The languages start to resemble each other even though they originate in very different places. Normally, uh, people from India should be great linguists because linguistics actually originated in India. And so in the 19th century, Western scholars started the science of linguistics by getting to know Indian linguistics. And so you see Pani is all over the place. I myself could never have given this lecture without Pani. And so, like, the, um, the very first word of Indian origin that I learned, except for yoga, was the word Sandhi. Sandhi means a euphonic word link. And uh, we learned that uh, in the class of diction, of speaking our own language properly, that um, in standard Dutch, you have a four-word Sandhi in the case of, uh, for instance, that thing, this is the English word, that thing, okay? Now, in Dutch, that ends in a voiceless consonant, and the next word, thing, starts with a voice consonant. Now, what happens when the two meet? Okay, in standard, let's just say, that thing. So, the, uh, the voice consonant influences the voiceless consonant and makes it voice. So the top of the first word adapts to the d of the second word. In the Flemish dialects, by contrast, the reverse happens. You don't say da ding, you say da ting. And so the, uh, the voice consonant adapts to the voiceless consonant. So you have two different sandhis. And so to explain this whole process, the teacher used the word Sandhi. And so, you see, this is a, a very fundamental element in linguistics that was borrowed from the Sanskrit grammarians. So, Hindus also have been the best linguists. Unfortunately, uh, they lambast linguistics. They say it's a pseudoscience employed by the ugly, vicious colonial racists and uh, just to divide and rule the Hindus and so on. And so, rather than taking the great opportunity that they get here, unfortunately, they, um, they have ignored this, uh, this linguistic element that also happens to be the foundation of the uh, uh, Indo-European language family. So, incidentally, uh, what you see here in this picture is the table of elements of Mendeleev. And Mendeleev actually, in the process of discovering this, uh, this system, based himself on the Sanskrit alphabet. You see that the same structural uh, perfection he saw in the Sanskrit alphabet, he applied that 
through the phenomena he was researching and his work. So don't underestimate yourself. Okay, some people say that Indo-European is a ghost language. It doesn't really exist. Now, I agree with you, you, you probably never going to meet anyone speaking Indo-European. Although nowadays, there is a website in Indo-European. Just like you can have a website in Sanskrit. You know, in this reconstructed language, you can start uh, writing poems and fairy tales. Um, and we know that Indo-European must have existed. You see, your, you know, suppose your grandmother died before you were born. You know, you can't prove she existed. You know, even if there are photographs and letters and so on of her, you know, some skeptic can say, yeah, but this is a forgery. You know, this wants to make us believe that she existed, but she never existed. Look, where is she? So the very fact that you exist is absolute proof that your grandmother existed. So it is very sure that today's uh, North Indian languages prove that Sanskrit and earlier ancestors exist. All right. Um, then you see the reconstruction of the evolution of these languages uh, follows the example of uh, the evolution of languages that we can observe. Like, for instance, we know Latin and we know the modern Romance languages that are descendants from vulgar Latin, like Italian, French, Spanish, and so on. So we see how this happens. You know, this is not some, some ghost theory that has been concocted by anyone. No, this is really happening. You can see it happening. And so that process is projected into the past where we can no longer see it happening but where it also must have happened. In this case, Proto-Indo-European is not too distant in time, some 6,000 years, and is not too far from earlier languages like Hittite, like Mycenae in Greek, and indeed like Vedic Sanskrit that were fairly close in time, like 2,000 years after. Um, Let's not start with the guy in the photograph. Let's go back a bit earlier. So several people, starting with the British Jesuit Thomas Stevens in 1583, already had uh, an impression that the Indian languages they met, you know, mostly traders on the coast who learned Gujarati, Marathi. Um, notice that there is some similarity with our own languages. Then this was systematically studied by a Jesuit based in India, namely Gaston Laurent Coeur who in 1767 sent a paper to the Academy in Paris uh, showing the relation between Sanskrit, Latin, and Greek. So you could say that that is the birthplace of Indo-European languages. <coughs> This development was made known, especially in India, by William Jones, and it's him you see in the picture, uh, who gave a speech in uh, Calcutta, 1786. It is known as the Philologer Lecture, because he, he says that no Philologer can study Sanskrit and fail to notice the great similarity with Latin and Greek. Although the difference is, and you see, be careful before you say, oh yeah, these ugly vicious colonialists want to disparage the, the beautiful Hindus. No, 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 no. He says very explicitly that Sanskrit is more perfect than Greek. You see, he praises Sanskrit as the, you know, the, the model, the, the, the perfection of what in Latin and Greek only exists in a very appropriate, um, approximated form. Okay, around that time also you have uh, the first use of the word Aryan, or at least in French, Aryan, uh, by Archetype du Perron, who is considered the father of Orientalism. You see some people nowadays 
give a negative meaning to Orientalist? Well, I'll tell you frankly, I am an Orientalist. So, it is with some respect that I speak of Arcadie de Perron, but he used the word Aryan in a more limited sense, namely Indo Iranian. So, and the Indians and the Iranians both call themselves Aryan. You know, that does not count for the Greeks and so on. So he gave a more limited meaning. And the meaning of Indo European, the whole language family, was given by Friedrich Schlegel in 1808. He also greatly glorified India. In fact, this was a, a cultural phase in Europe of uh, Indo mania. You know, nowadays they speak of Indophobia. Well, in those days there was Indo mania. They greatly liked India. And for all kinds of cultural problems in Europe, India was a solution. Like the great French uh, post Christian free thinker Voltaire praised uh, India and said, you know, he had read the paper by Gaston Laurent Curzou. Uh, he said, yes, you see, uh, our, the origin of our civilization is on the basis of the Kanga. Now, um, the original meaning, incidentally, of Arya is, and I'm not going to ask it because I know what you're going to say and you're wrong. Uh, you know, everybody here is going to say, yeah, Arya means noble. And, you know, you could argue that. The, the earliest use of the word Arya in that sense is probably the Vedic phrase, uh, let us make the world Arya, let us ennoble the world. You see, it does not mean, let us linguistically Indo-Europeanize the world. It does not even mean, let us religiously Hinduize the world. You see, but let us ennoble the world, that, that, that's a fair translation. Nevertheless, the general meaning in the Rig Veda is something else. Namely, it means us. You see, in the later we discovered Hittite language, but then also in Iranian, and in Vedic Sanskrit, Arya is always a self-reference. It means our own tribe, you know, our fellow countrymen. And so in the case of the Veda, it refers to the Paurava tribe, the descendants of Puru. So not to everyone who speaks Sanskrit, you know, but only to that specific tribe. Krishna was not an Arya, because he was a Yadava, he was not a Paurava. And um, in, in, in scenes of conflict in the Rigveda, like the Battle of the Ten Kings, you can see that their own comrades are called Arya, but sometimes their enemies are also called Arya, namely when someone of their own tribe sides with the enemy. You know, then he's not called an Arya, an you know, ignoble traitor or whatever. He may be a traitor, but he's still an Arya, he's still one of us. And conversely, when a foreigner comes to help the Aryans or the Zapata of a tribe, he may be praised anything you want, like Mount Hata or the Ishwaku dynasty. He may be praised, but he will never be called Arya. So Arya period does not have the universal moral meaning of noble, no, it has the ethnic meaning of us, fellow country. Uh, the guy you see in the photograph is um, Friedrich Schlegel. Um, so he's the one who, who praised India and so on. At that time, it was a given, it was accepted by practically everyone that India was the homeland. The original theory is the outer of India theory. You know, don't let them tell you, oh, it's a concoction by the other vicious Hindu nationalist. No, no, no. It was invented by Europeans, typically, firstly by Indo-Europeans living uh, by Europeans living in India, and so you see it has to do with the necessity of getting to know Sanskrit. You know that's that's the real historical basis of the theory, and then also with the need to realize the importance of India. You see, many people in Europe uh, 
India has no place in their world. This is very in the distance, and they didn't know anything about it. It's where spices came from. That must be, you know, ginger came from India. Uh, but that's about all. And uh, you look at a map, you see, the world map, still today, most world maps are in Mercator projection, which are made, I mean, to project. Uh, a, a sphere like the Earth onto a two-dimensional map that necessitates some deformation. And uh, so these maps were made to serve the needs of navigators at sea. And so the angles had to be correct, had to be just as if they would be found on the ground. And uh, therefore the surfaces were greatly deformed. And so if you look at those maps, uh, places far away from the equator are magnified enormously. Those close to the equator become very small. So if you look at that map, you know, the whole Indian subcontinent is smaller than Scandinavia, whereas in reality it's as big as the whole of Europe. So you see, without any malice or conspiracy, colonialism and so on, people naturally well, you know, ignored India, neglected India, greatly minimized the importance of India. So it is no coincidence that it's precisely Europeans living in India who, who valued India much more. And so there you have the idea that India is your homeland. Um, so that theory remained in vogue until about 1840. The, um, the main alternative school were the Christians who took the Bible seriously and so they thought that the Indo-Europeans were descendants of Japheth who is one of the three sons of Noah. Noah is the, is the Hebrew Manu, you know, the survivor of the flood and so there are only very few people left after the flood and so there are these three sons that people the world you know, the Africans are the, the descendants of Ham. Then the Jews themselves and the people around are those of Sem. And then they are the Semites. And then the Indo-Europeans are the descendants of Jaffa. So they said that Armenia, where the Ark had landed, that that was the homeland. And so that's just an, an alternative one. And we will, we will see this alternative back later on. Um, but so the main thing, and especially among people who cared about the linguistic evidence, was that India was the homeland. Okay, and so that was not called the Out of India theory. The term didn't exist yet, but it was the, uh, the Out of India theory. Um, so that term was, uh, or that idea, that theory was revived in 1982 by. A.D. Stetna, a proxy, we were already very old at that time. He had been the secretary of Sri Aurobindo. And so he wrote a book called Kasa, meaning Kokum. And it's about the evidence for Kokum in the Harappan cities, archaeological evidence, and the literary evidence of the Rigveda. And so he concludes that the Rigveda doesn't have Kokum and therefore must be older than the Harappan cities which do have one. And so, you see, he concludes that it's impossible that the Vedic people had come into India at 1500 BC when they were already there, even before the Harappan cities which started in 2600 BC. Uh, so he, he puts the, the, the Rig Veda in 3000 or so BC, which is what I am also going to do. The term out of India theory was coined by Edwin Bryant, an American scholar, in about 1997. We will also see his contribution later on. Right, so this is the uh, birth of Indo-European scholarship with Franz Hoff, who um, wrote a comparative conjugation of Sanskrit in 1816. In 2016, there was a Bicentenary conference in Berlin uh, about his work and what has become of it since. Uh, so he started the 
reconstruction of what original process neural scheme must have been like. Initially, it was very much like sensory. Gradually, as the nodes got more sophisticated, they made more differences to sensory as we say. Um, something uh, strange about him is that in his work, he already noticed similarities with a completely different language group, which was called Malayo Polynesian at the time, or Austronesian, the language is spoken in Indonesia, in uh, New Zealand, in Hawaii, in the Easter Islands, and so on. So that's very strange to link that with Indo-European, which is very far removed geographically. Um, but so he said, well, I can't explain how this happened, but clearly there is a relation between the two. And so later on, some uh, other uh, linguists have taken up that, that same line of thinking. It's not generally accepted nowadays, but still, it's it's it, you know it's marginal, but it's not deemed you know far fetched. Okay, August Schlegel in 1834, and he was the brother of uh, Friedrich Schlegel, as we just saw. He took the opposite position. He is the first one to theorize the Aryan theory. Mm -hmm. So he says that the homeland must be outside of India, namely in the Caucasian area. And that's where most theorists later on have put the homeland. Somewhere around the Caucasus, either in Armenia, south of the Caucasus, or north of the Caucasus, that is the favorite nowadays, uh, in you know the Volga River in Ukraine. Uh, so um, with him, I mean, you know, many people saw many things, but with him really the balance tilts. And so now we get a non-Indian homeland theory becoming gradually favorite. Um, now, at that time too, there was an Aryanization debate, because this Aryanization theory was argued against once more by Europeans living in India. At that time, I am not aware of any Indians participating in the debate. But you see, the Indians among the Europeans they still sided with the other in their theory. And one name that was surprising is Mount Stuart Elphinstone. You see, he had served as the governor of uh, the Mumbai presidency. He was for, for the outer India Company. So he was a colonialist par excellence. And yet he defended the outer India theory. It is opposed to their foreign origin that neither in the code of Manu, nor I believe in the Vedas, nor in any book that is certainly older than the code, is there any allusion to a prior residence. So he, he notes an argument that is still used today in the Vedas and other Sanskrit books. You never find a reference to some influx from somewhere else except here. So he says the question therefore is still open. There is no reason whatever for thinking that the Hindus ever inhabited any country but their present. Note that uh, this implies that the other branches immigrated into their present habitat. And some of these other branches have no memory or show no memory of such an immigration. There is no particular story of uh, the Slavic people moving into the Slavic territory. Although, 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 this afternoon I spoke with someone who had studied in Ukraine or somewhere there, and who says that you see the Slavic people themselves say, oh, but originally we came from the East. So I, I, I'm not aware that this is written down anywhere, but clearly such a memory is not. Now, at any rate, in Irish and Scandinavian writings, you know, writings from the first millennium AD, which means 
2,000 or so years after they must have immigrated, they still mention their own immigration. They are very much aware that the country where they lived then is not their country of origin. Now, in the case of the Rigveda, according to the Iron Immigration Theory, they immigrated in 1600 or so BC, and immediately they started writing the Rigveda. Now, it is impossible that they were unaware of an immigration if there had been one. <coughs> now, that's of course why the first translations of the Rigveda try to force them into the mode of an immigration story. So to speak. <coughs> Um, one argument which uh, Mount Stuart Elphinstone uh, takes issue with is that the homeland must lie somewhere in the middle. And so that argument also is still used all the time. You know, I think the European conferences are I see it used by people on the stage, but especially if you see, I asked around among the backbenchers. Why do you believe in this idea? And so that they come up with it all the time. Yeah, you see, India is too far away. It must be somewhere in the middle. Now, you see, that is, um, I mean, for a linguist, you know, he ought to know that that's not the scenario that you usually have. For example, the Russian language has expanded enormously. But it has expanded only in one direction. It started in Kiev, which is now in Ukraine, went all the way to Alaska. And it didn't go west at all. Um, you see, Arabic started in Arabia, went all the way to Morocco, and didn't go to the east at all. The Bantu languages in Africa started in Nigeria, thereabouts, went all the way down to the Cape, and didn't go north at all. You see, in fact, their expansion historically, it's thanks to their uh, adoption of agriculture, which you know, allowed them to produce more food and therefore to grow more numerous. Now, if they went north, they ended up in the Sahara Desert, where you can't practice agriculture. So the reason why people migrate are not symmetrical. You see, the south and the north have very different conditions. There is far more reason for them to move to the south than to move to the north. Therefore, their homeland is not in the middle. Um, <clears throat> so um, so the, the more likely story is that this, what they call the Yamla, the pit grave culture, where you have people being buried vertically, okay, the pit grave. Um, that uh, culture is only a secondary homeland. When you look at it from inside Europe, you see the Germanic, Celtic, Italian people and so on, they came from the east, they came from this area around the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, but that's not their origin, you see, because in that area too they had come from somewhere else. So it's a secondary homeland, and very orthodox scholars nowadays admit that. Like in linguistics, Paul Hegarty, or in genetics, uh, David Reich. If David Reich became a household name in India in 2018 when he gave genetic evidence for an influx of people into India around 1700 BC. So all the Aryan invasionists shouted, Yeah, hallelujah! Yeah, this is the proof of the Iron Invasion. Well, it's a bit more complicated than that, but we shall see. But, you see, uh, one thing that they wrote everywhere, that Tony Joseph, for example, wrote in defense, uh, was that he had shown that this Yamna culture was the homeland. Now, that's not true. Even then it was not true, because in that very room that he cited all the time, he himself, uh, located the homeland in northern Iran. So, not uh, in the Yamla culture, not even in Europe. You know, notice, you know, it's an interesting snippet of information that there are no European languages in Europe. You see, all the languages spoken in Europe nowadays demonstrate.
possibly uh, originate elsewhere. You see, the Basque language came overseas through the Mediterranean from the northern Caucasus. Well, that's maybe Europe, borderline Europe, okay? Then the Uralic languages, Finnish, Hungarian, and so on, they came from Siberia, from the Oms <laughs> basin. Um, so they're also not European. And in the Indo European languages, that's what we're talking about. So even if they didn't come from India, then at least they came from the Volga River or something. Again, entirely borderline Europe. So whereas, you know, Africa is full of African languages, Asia is full of Asian languages. So we don't have that, you know. Somehow our parents were mute and we had to borrow language from outside. Oh, what happened? What did I do? Okay. <coughs> so Elton Stone was not impressed with this uh, symmetry scenario. And so he was really busy. Um, he also points out that, you know, if you want this this homeland in the middle, well, you see what they now say is the middle, is the middle between the east and the west, but it's not the middle between the north and the south. He says, you see, if they can go all the way to the Bay of Bengal, and all the way to Ireland and Iceland, then why haven't they gone all the way to Arabia, to the east? <coughs> so, uh, I mean, you see, if, if, if your argument is that kind of general impression, then you know, this is a relevant consideration. Anyway, um, let's see, so, so, what we then get is the Aryan invasion theory. So, if the homeland was in or around the Caucasus, or any other uh, area outside of India, like Germany, like Atlantis, this was also a homeland theory, uh, like Belarus. There is also one, and Anatolia is also one. Recently, in the 19th century, there was still uh, a strong uh, argument in favor of Anatolia. So all these theories imply an invasion into India. Now, the development of linguistic insights in the middle of the 19th century was a factor in favor of homeland outside India because they started to see that there are more and more differences between Sanskrit and Proto-Indo-European, what so they were reconstructing. Now, this is a bit of a uh, easy, uh, primitive reasoning. First they said, okay, Proto-Indo-European is equal to Sanskrit, therefore the homeland must be the country of Sanskrit, which is India. And now that they say, well, there's a difference between these two languages, therefore, uh, the homeland must be outside India. Now, that, that's rather silly, because, you see, languages that remain on the spot also change. You see, long ago, I took a course of classical Tamil, and I actually read the Tiru Kural in Tamil. Of course, I've forgotten every word of it, but at least, this much I noticed that this was quite different from modern Tamil. And <clears throat> so uh, the argument of they must have come from outside because the language has changed, well, that's, that's not, not correct. A linguist ought to have known that, but nevertheless, this is uh, how the reasoning went. Uh, then there is the element of linguistic paleontology. This means that from the words existing in an ancient language, you can deduce in what kind of an environment the language was spoken. You see, if a language has no word for snow, then probably it was spoken in the desert or there somewhere. And um, if it had no word for rain, you know, that's really problematic, but then, you know, maybe it was in Antarctica or somewhere. Uh, so you can't take this method very far, but at least somewhat. Um, and so they deduced that from the vocabulary, uh, it was clear that it could not have been in a country with a hot climate, because animals from a cold climate like bears and wolves were mentioned, and no elephants and tigers and so on. Um, that was
this reasoning at the time. In fact, there are new facts that throw a different light on this. But so, all I'm explaining right now is how this change from out of India to our realization came about. And so this was this was formalized, this was became like the official theory in 1926 with Gordon Shiley, an Australian scholar. Um, and from then on we have practically a consensus for this uh, Ukrainian-Russian region. Uh, so this is Maria Gimbutas, a Lithuanian-American scholar who, in 1956, launched the Kurgan theory. So in Russia, you have the discovery of uh, gray hills. It is the city who were buried in a grave. Uh, a hill was built above their grave. Um, and so that was a typical element also in the, uh, the Yamnaya culture. And so it is she who gave the first description of how this conquest of Europe was to happen. Now, we have no quarrel with that stuff about the conquest of Europe. It doesn't really concern India. There was, at any rate, a, a, a westward <coughs> conquest going on. So, you know, that's fine. Um, she says that the Indo-Europeans destroyed the pre-existing old European culture. Now, this old European is not really European. Uh, you see, these, what existed before that was the, the first agriculturists who came from outside Europe, from uh, Anatolia. So even then, you see, there were hardly any European languages left in Europe. There must have been some hunter-gatherer, very primitive caveman type languages, but they disappeared in favor of the enormous expansion of the incoming agriculture, because they did their own food production and so on, they controlled their remote territory. So very probably, but nobody was there to do this thing, but very probably what you had then in Europe, linguistically, was a continuum of all kinds of dialects that were closely related to each other and that stemmed from this original language of the farmers in Anatolia. And this language was probably Hattic. You know, Hattic is the same word as Hittite, only the Hittites, when they invaded there, they took over the name, or at least the other people around them gave them the name that accrued to the people living in the same place. So they had been living this Hathi people. And so that same Hathi people must have expanded into Europe, taking a new culture and bringing their language. Like you have a great culture in Europe, uh, 6,000, 5,000 BC, the Dinsha culture, after a place in Serbia. So, you know, it's nice, it's great, and it's, it's molded by this Maria Mutas. It's, of course, supposed to be matriarchal, you know, the ugly, vicious uh, Indo Europeans with their patriarchal thunder gods, Indra, you know, uh, they, uh, they were the bad guys, and here there was a matriarchal culture, peaceful, nice, and, you know, they didn't go hunting, you know, they this separate culture. And um, so the feminist movement, among others, was very enthusiastic for this theory. Well, um, okay, that may be a phase in European history, but again, you see this, uh, it came from outside Europe, and it was only a phase before that you had, again, non-agriculture people. Um, so the older, the really European languages disappeared. Meanwhile, what came in were also so-called abstracts, that is to say, other languages from which you borrow through context, uh, like Basque, who was a foreign language that settled in Europe, or like Semito-Hamitic. The Phoenicians from Lebanon colonized cities all across the Mediterranean and into uh, Northern Europe. So a very well known one is Cornwall, where they exploited tin mines. And they went all the way to the area of what is now Hamburg. And so you find some words in Germanic and very many words in Irish 
that originally came from the knee. Uh, okay, so this is all not Indo European, but this is Indo European. So this is what most people are using. Uh, so they started on the Volga River there about, and they spread everywhere, also to India. If this immigration from there took place, was in the case of India, this immigration invade. Many people nowadays object to the word invade. And uh, I think wrong. Um, the word invasion refers to the result of this immigration, more than the method. Some people think, oh, you see, there's something, you know, something we don't like about military invasion. Now, real historians point out that everywhere, practically, you have this, this element of conquest. If in America they speak English or Spanish, well, it's because a violent conquest has taken place. And uh, so this squeamishness, oh no, it, it couldn't be military, you know, the, the Indo Europeans were peaceful, you know, they under the radar they infiltrated India. Nobody notices them, they didn't leave any trace, they didn't leave any new pottery, any new burial sites, any weapons, they didn't leave any scenes of conquest. No, but yet they transformed this advanced and extremely numerous uh, culture and, and gave them their language and their religion without anybody noticing. You think that's what we are now supposed to believe? It is their answer to the fact that never has any archaeological proof been found for this group of people walking into India. Certainly not military, but not of another type either. So there's no change in pottery that you can trace somewhere to Central Asia. Um, so, so this is the way they try to do it. Other Indo-European is ridiculed this whole alternative. Uh, like that now, Sir <coughs> um, So I don't have to do it myself. I can safely hide behind the broad shoulders of the established Indo-Europeanists that the theory of other Indo-Europeanists, that it can never have been an invasion, that that is uh, what well, that can be ignored. Okay, so it was an invasion. Now, um, in European history, they, they talk about Aryans went hand in hand with the talk about, well, that the Jews were misery and, you know, anti-Jewish. You know, this was heavily uh, indebted to the history of Christianity, which in principle, you know, has a problem with the Jews because the Jews think the Messiah hasn't come yet, and they claim that Jesus was the Messiah, or the Messiah is certainly there. Um, but so it took a new form in the 19th century, a racial form. Racial science was the new hit, the new big thing. <coughs> and in fact, uh, one of the first theorists, uh, Johann Blumenbach, had already thought that the Caucasus, which supposedly was the homeland of an European, was also the homeland of the white race. And so the two became more and more intertwined. From around 1855, we have Arthur de Gaudineau, who definitely starts uniting the two, starts using Aryan in a racial sense. And so this was the heyday of racial science at the time, they considered it a science, especially after Charles Darwin published his book, The Origin of and at that time, the British Prime Minister and great colonialist Benjamin Disraeli called race the key to all of history. And so this now entered the Indo European uh, scholarship with Theodor Pershke calling the Aryans blonde and blue eyed, Carl Penck advocating the homeland in Denmark, or Gustav Kosina in northern Germany, but at any rate in the north far north. So, um, what also happened, what also
also you know, was the, the nail in the coffin of the art of Indian theory. Was the then new translations of the Rig Veda appeared. You see, the Rig Veda was now put to the service of the uh, invasion scenario. So they tried to find traces in the Rig Veda of an invasion, of episodes of invasion. And so, you know, some, some words were interpreted as describing the aboriginals. And so they were the black men, uh, like uh, the word anas, meaning mouthless, speechless, you know, uh, uh, not comprehensible, speaking a foreign language. That was reinterpreted as apnas, without nose, you know, with a flat nose, like some blacks have. Um, the word black is used in all kinds of uh, contexts, but sometimes also in the description of the enemy in, in struggle. But that's normal. You see, that doesn't indicate skin color. For instance, in the Second World War, in French, in Dutch, in English, blacks meant the collaborators with the Axis powers. In British security reports, to Mark Chandra Bose, who collaborated with the Axis, is always described as a black. Um, now, in, the, in the, the, the description of the Battle of the Ten Kings, uh, the word black also appears, and so it could be uh, freed from its racial connotation by pointing out this use as enemy. But here there's even more. You see, the, the enemies are called Asikni Visha. Asikni meaning black, Visha meaning tribe. So they made it the black tribe. And then in footnote, you can all this refers to the black aborigines. Now, in reality, this, is mean, this means something else. Asikni, black, is also the name of a river, the Black River. And it's a normal name for a river. You know, in many places in the world, you have a river names that, if you analyze them, turn out to mean the Black River. Like the Thames, you know, the river in Oxford and London, the Thames. That word Thames is related to a Sanskrit word that you all know, namely Tamas. So it means dark, you know, the dark river. And uh, so here the Chenab in Western Java is also called the Asikni. Now, where do the Asikni Visha come from? You see, the battle takes place on the Ravi River which today happens to be the border between India and Pakistan. So in a sense, the Battle of the Ten Kings was the first Indo-Pak war, which was of course won by the Eastern side, by the British people. Um, but at any rate, they were on the, what was that called the Pakistan, or today the Ravi River, which is the next river. So the, the, the Ravi River was parallel with the Chenab River. And so the enemy came from the, from the west, which is from the next river, the basin of the Asikni river. So Asikni Visha simply means the people from the Chenab. He had nothing to do with skin color. Moreover, in the Aryan invasion scenario, the invaders are supposed to come from the west, and the natives are in the east. Now here you have just the reverse. You see, they come from the east, originally from the Saraswati in Haryana, then the Ravi in East Punjab, and the enemy comes from the West, from the Chenab in West Punjab. So you have exactly the opposite from the Aryan invasion scenario. So you see, if they had been more careful uh, in translating the Rig Veda, they would not have read any invasion against the black aboriginals in it. Oh yeah, and then you have the word varna, you know, which can mean color, but it means specifically a quality. And so uh, this was reinterpreted as meaning skin color. And so you see this racial element was brought into it heavily. Now this is contrary to Hindu tradition. For instance, in the Manus Mithi, the uh, the China, the Chinese, and the, the Yavanas, the Greeks 
are both colon aria. That is to say, they have aria qualities. They participated in aria culture, but they didn't observe the rules anymore. So they are colon aria. So their race doesn't matter. Their language doesn't matter. Right? That has nothing to do with aria. Even Max Müller, whom so many people in India demonize as the man behind the uh, Aryan invasion theory, he opposed this increasing racialization of the concept of Aryan. He said, I have declared again and again that if I say Aryan, I mean neither blood nor bones, nor hair nor skull. I mean simply those who speak an Aryan language. Now, after 1945, it suddenly became a taboo to speak of the Aryan race. And so, when I studied and so on, we were all impressed, you know, we were all told, you know, never to link uh, Indo European with any racial uh, element. Unfortunately, today I see this racial element coming back. Now they are no longer measuring skulls and so on to find physical characteristics. Now they use genes. And so back then, the typical Aryan skull was a long skull with a long nose and a, a sort of a, you know, a, a protuberance on the back of the skull, which I don't have, I'm not a good Aryan. Uh, <laughs> so there were physical characteristics that inspired the Aryan. Um, so today you have the Aryan gene. You know, when this book of, uh, of David Reich four years ago became the big news in India, I read that in a number of papers, you know, the Aryan gene, R1A, some term from genetics which I don't really know, you know, that was the Aryan gene. And then some, some corpse uh, from Harappa was uh, analyzed and it did not have this gene. So they said that it is genetically Dravidian. So you do also have Dravidian gene. Now, if, this is totally absurd. You see, tell me if, uh, if Martin Luther King or so, any American black who speaks English, who has never known any other language than English, is he genetically English? You see, genetically he would be very, very different from William Shakespeare, yet they speak the same language. So these physical characteristics don't determine uh, your language. Obviously, I mean, everybody should have known that. Um, Max Müller carried the Sanskrit name Moksha Mula, by the way. And so Indians tend to identify the Iron Invasion theory with Max Müller, which is a bit unfair to him. Uh, in Germany, this was already a few decades old. Um, but he became very famous because he launched his book series, The Sacred Books of the East. Translations of books from China, Japan, India, Persia. And they had a deep, deep, deep impact on European culture. Because now all these writers who couldn't bother to learn Sanskrit at all, they had access to the you know, very rich ideas world from Asia. Um, the major claim to his notoriety in India is his estimate of the chronology of the supposed invasion. You see, he launched the idea that it was in 1500 BC. And that is still the orthodoxy that, you know, Indian school children are all learning that there was an invasion in 1500 BC. Back then, you see, that was already questioned. And not only by the ugly vicious Hindu nationalists, but also by his own colleagues. You know, they said, well, you know, this is not science, you have no evidence for this. And so his own pupil, Moritz Lindeni, gave a few other non-linguistic reasons why this couldn't be true. He said, you see, the whole evolution of ideas from the early Rig Veda down to, let's say, Buddhism, that's too much, too complex, and so to cram into a few centuries. So he, he also, on totally different grounds, placed the Igbeya in the third millennium. Um, now, under pressure from these criticisms, Max Muller himself said that 
he really didn't know. He said being a mere guest. Uh, and yet, you see, because of his prestige, you know, that, that estimate of his had already caught hold. It was in all the textbooks already, and it couldn't be changed anymore. Well, it could, but you know, because of his prestige, nobody did. <coughs> so, the Aryan invasion theory gets very politicized, like in the British colonialists, of course, said that, you know, these history theories are only the furniture of empire. They make the empire more palatable to the colonized people. Um, because the British, by invading India, did nothing wrong. They only repeated what the Hindus themselves had done. You know, so don't call us invaders. You are invaders. Ah. Uh, now, National Socialism is the even better known politicization of it. So the race theorist of the Nazis, Hans Dunze, took the Aryan invasion theory as the paradigm for the Nazi world. And that's saying something. And he made sure that all the school textbooks are so and so. So effectively the Iron Division theory is the most politicized historical theory ever in history. Um, so what he said, what Hitler also thought, was that the Iron Division theory was the perfect illustration of the Nazi world. You see, first you have the dynamic whites who subdue the indolent uh, indigenous people. You know, they could never have conquered Europe, but we conquered India. Um, then they wisely imposed the caste apartheid uh, to preserve their race. You know, not only the Nazis were race conscious, even the ancient Aryans, you know, thousands of years ago, they were already race conscious. That's why you have a caste. But unfortunately, after hours, some of these upper caste men, you see, took a little holiday and went to the brothels of the indigenous women and, you know, caste mixing took place. And so after a number of generations, they weren't all that pure anymore. And so they lost their racial purity. They lost some of their superiority. They were still superior to the fully indigenous people, but they were inferior to the fully Aryan. That is why, and of course British colonialism this was also uh, essential, and as you might know, Hitler greatly supported the British Empire, he wanted to do in Russia what the British had been doing in India. Um, so they needed the colonization by the British. They themselves could never have invented Westminster democracy. They could never have built the railway system. Fortunately for them, the generous cousins from far away and through the Aryan world came over and helped them into civilization. See, um, among Hitler's own uh, utterances about the Hindus, there is indeed a racial interpretation of the Aryan invasion theory, and it is worth quoting. We know that the Hindus in India are a people mixed from the lofty Aryan immigrants. And mind you, he doesn't say invasion, he says immigrants, just as the, North, the modern orthodoxy wants it and the dark black aboriginal population. And that this people, this you, uh, is bearing the consequences today, for it is also the slave people of a race that almost seems, and what now follows is, in Hitler's mind, not a company, a second Jewry. You know, the Jews are a terrible misery for the world, and so on. In India, too, there was this racial politicization. Uh, in about 1870, Jyoti Rao Kule, himself a product of a missionary school, uh, identified the upper caste as Aryan invaders. And so they don't belong in India, they're foreigners. Um, 
Conversely, you see, at the time there was still no stigma attaching to Arya. So the single ladies in Sri Lanka identified with the Arya because they spoken in the European language in a sea of European languages. <coughs> Uh, also, not mentioned here, I think, uh, the Sikhs strongly identified as Aryan. You see, they collaborated with the British in a big way. They were privileged in the army and so on. And they actually looked like every cartoon, pictures, the baby fishes. You know, with their hair and their turban and so on. They looked exactly like Vasishta and Vishwamitra and so on. <laughs> so they did to her And that also justified their closeness with the British. Um, so recently you had the, the, just now, president of the Congress party, Malikarjuna Karge, who shouted in parliament, you Aryans don't belong in India. And then, you know, I read a press comment about it the day after, where they made it even worse. They said, the only indigenous people in India are the Adivasis. Now, the word Adivasi, meaning the tribal, is not so innocent. You see, it looks like a Sanskrit word, and many people think it's ancient, and it proves that the Indians themselves were conscious that they were really foreigners, and that the Adivasis were native. But, you know, that's a mistake. You know, this word was, and I dare say, concocted by the Christian missionaries in about 1920. And so it is a one-word disinformation campaign. You know, I've actually seen Western scholars say, yeah, the Adivasis are the original inhabitants of India. See, because, you know, that's what the word means, you know. This, this one word is used as proof for this whole theory that they are indigenous and all the rest of you are not. It became the basis of the reservation system, which still started very small in the uh, uh, 1935 Government of India Act. And now it's all over the place. I don't need to tell you more about that. Uh, so genetics is a new form of physical uh, Anthropology, um, David Wright says 1700 BC. Some Indian geneticists like Vera Gray and Raj Vedon deny this and they argue against it. Now, not being a geneticist, I'm not going to try to, you know, overrule David Wright. Maybe he's right. Only he doesn't prove the argument Vedon people. You see, in history, we find the influx into India of the Shakas, the Greeks, the Kushanas, the Huns, the Turks, and they all leave their genes in India. And so if you analyze the genes, it, it, it seems, you know, for what it is worth, I've read in some genetics paper that in 17% of the Indian population, you see genes coming from Central Asia. I don't know if it's that percentage. Anyway, you know, there is a presence of Central Asian genes. Why not? Only none of those people have imposed their language. They haven't even preserved their language. There is no part of India where they speak Greek or Turkish or Tocharian or whatever they spoke. <coughs> also, the, the peaceful uh, refugee communities, the Parsis, the Syrian Christians, also completely assimilated, at least linguistically. Even if they managed to preserve their religion, they did not bother to preserve their language. And so, what is the difference with these Aryans? Why did they suddenly preserve their language and even impose it on a far, far, far more numerous population? That, that's bizarre. Anyway, you see, this is a question we can study, but we don't really need to, because we have other reasons to know for sure that whatever influx may have happened in 1700 BC, it was not the Aryans. It was not the people who brought Sanskrit into India. Why not? Well, because the Rig Veda is demonstrably older than that. You see, the Rig Veda goes back to some 3000 BC. 
and we know this for sure for a number of reasons. For instance, it describes the Saraswati River as a big ocean going river. Now the Saraswati desiccated in about 1900 BC. You know, in the you know, the Mahabharata, which is shortly <coughs> after, we see descriptions of the Mahabharata disappearing. We see Balarama going on pilgrimage to the the dying point of the, of the Saraswati. So in the Veda, this is not there yet, but the Veda is old. Um, we find the argument of bronze and iron. You read Veda as a bronze age text. And some, some people think that it is the Aryans who brought iron into India. Now we know by now that iron originates in India. <coughs> And not in the, the, the Vedic area, but in Tamil Nadu, in, in, in Andhra Pradesh. That's where the first iron is. And so the age of iron is moving backwards ever more. So you see, on that ground too, you can't say, oh, the Vedas only started in 1500 BC. Then you have archaeology astronomy. Now, let me very briefly explain. Um, you have uh, astronomical phenomenon that allows you to date ancient events if at least this information is given in ancient sources, namely the precession. This is a very slow movement of the stars vis-a-vis -vis the earthly seasons. And so if it is mentioned in the text that this particular constellation coincided with the position of the sun or the full moon in uh, winter solstice or um, spring equinox, then you can date that roughly, you know, give or take a century. And so you have a number of uh, descriptions of uh, stellar positions that took place in about 2200 BC. And you don't find them in the Veda, you do find them in later texts. You see in the Atharva Veda several times, in the Kaushita Kitramana, in the Shatapata Brahmana, you find that you know they are around 2000 BC, after the Veda. Then you have the, um, an astronomical manual, this is the Jyotishi Vedanga, uh, that um, dates itself several times consistently to about the 1400th century BC. It's a totally post vedic text. It presupposes that both the Rig Veda and the Yajna Veda are complete and available. Um, so, you know, you have a number of astronomical indications that the Rig Veda must be pushed back into the third millennium, which is before this influx that they derived in their society. So, whoever came into India, it was not the bringers of science. Then there are a number of linguistic elements to exclude those. Um, interestingly, <coughs> in the colonial period and even after, many Hindus accepted the Aryan invasion theory, and some even enthusiastically, because it, you know, after they had been subdued by the British, this <coughs> brought them back up in the hierarchy by making them at least related to the British. In the US, this Aryan invasion argument was used by several people who approached the court to be reclassified. At that time, there was still a racial hierarchy in America. So they wanted to be reclassified from color to white. Sometimes it succeeded, sometimes not. But so it was useful as an argument. It's implicit also, I, I'm not aware of anywhere where Mahatma Gandhi said it explicitly, but it's implicit in Gandhi's own argument that the South African Indians should be upgraded from the black category to the white category. <coughs> so some people accepted it, even Hindu nationalists. So again, the argument, oh, it's a Hindu nationalist concoction, that's neither here nor there. Uh, Savarkar accepted it. The uh, art historian B.S. Agarwal accepted it. B. Uh, Balaganga Tilak even thought of his own version in his book Ar Arctic Home in the Vedas. So he thought they came from Siberia somewhere. Um, 
the whole the whole uh, debate actually you see for for me as a historian it's interesting you know it's exciting but you know politically really it ought to be totally irrelevant i mean what are we talking about <laughs> you see, in Europe at the moment, there is a big immigrant population. And so some people say, yeah, you know, these Algerians, they don't belong here. And other people say, no, you see, look at this, you know, they're totally integrated and so on. These people have been there for like 50 years. Okay? Many nations, 400 years ago, didn't exist. Where was the American nation? Today, Americans are very nationalistic and so on. They can't say, oh, we, we've been here for 4,000 years. No, they haven't. Yeah, in India, uh, the, uh, an Adivasi tribe, the Nagas, in Nagaland, have immigrated into India about 1,000 years ago, which for American standards would be very ancient. By Indian standards, it's very recent. And yet, I have never heard anyone denying the Naga the right to be Indians. You see, I mean, thousand years ought to be enough. Well, for some people, four thousand years are not enough. You see, Aryans, you don't belong in India. Yeah, I mean, this really, everybody who hears this ought to laugh. And yet, you see, many academics in Europe are taking this seriously. Yeah, you know, down with the Aryans. Yeah. Down with Brahmin's patriarchs. <coughs> So it is the Aryan invasion believers in India who make it a political issue. And that has forced Hindu nationalists to react. Um, yes, yes, I have to hurry. Uh, so I'll take out the most important one. Um, so it is completely false thing that the Aryan invasion believers think that the out of India theory is a Hindu nationalist invention. It existed a lot earlier, and not all uh, Indian uh, or Hindu nationalists believe in it. Um, so, I mean, there are a lot of misunderstandings that hamper the debate. However, on both sides, they argue, you know, the out of India theory was concocted by the Hindu nationalists for years. I hear all the time, oh, the Aryan debate theory was concocted by the Aryan nations. We don't belong in it. Well, both theories are untrue. You see, the genesis of the theory is quite innocent, sometimes wrong because people are limited in their knowledge. There's all kinds of information that in the 19th century they didn't have yet, and so on. So, even if the theory was wrong, it was not concocted. You know? So, you see, this, this conspiracy theory that there's a, an evil intention behind everything that, you know, you should outgrow and the enemy should also be killed. So, around 2000, there was a debate between the two theories, uh, thanks to the efforts of um, Edwin Bryan. He also edited a book together with Rory Patton, The Indo-Aryan Controversy, which brings together a number of papers for and against the Aryan invasion theory. That's the only case, to my knowledge, of a real debate between the two. After that, the Aryan invasion people closed the door and started stonewalling every alternative position. It must be said that in that process, the Hindus also made some mistakes that facilitated this uh, hostile attitude of the other side. Um, so a famous incident in this regard is a, a front page story in the front line titled The Horse Play at the House. And it's about the foul views of the horse argument. And so you see some people have said, yeah, you see the Harappan culture contains no depiction of horses. But it also contains no depiction of cows, whereas it does contain depictions of bulls. So somehow these bulls came about without having horses around to put them in the world. Uh, horses, cows. Okay, so the bulls existed without cows. And um, so you see this argument is strange. Moreover, very few, but a number of horse depictions have been found. 
Now, NS Rajaram, which is Hindi system, because um, that's typical of the Hindu side, there are no Indo European studies in Indian universities. So these are all amateurs taking time off their proper field to do this research also. Often they make mistakes. So NS Rajaram took a seal with an animal with the head missing. You know, a corner had broken off the seal. And so he had an artist complete, you know, reconstruct the missing piece. And according to him, this was a horse. So you only see the body of the animal, not the head. And so he put the horse head on it. Um, now, it's a, the result is a bit funny because the horse looks the other way. You know, it doesn't really have to look into the camera, but at least, you know, it, it, it ought to be shown from the side. And this is, this is uh, not convincing. And so the enemy side, uh, Michael Ritzel, whom you see here, uh, said that uh, he had made it up. You know, he had, uh, he had falsified the evidence. And so that's not true. He immediately, you know, when presenting the evidence, he said himself, this is an artist reconstruction. Nevertheless, this is a very poor argument. And um, so th again, you see, there was no conspiracy. There was no intention to fool anyone. Nevertheless, it was a mistake. And so, using that kind of mistake made by Hindus, the other side has it fairly easy to depict them as a bunch of buffoons. Ah. Um, so, this Michael Ritzel, you know, if you ever take care to read the literature about the <coughs> out of India theory, you will read the name often as the demonized enemy par excellence. Though he's a nice guy, I know him personally, but all the RN debate teaches us to be wrong. Now, here is an incident that really calls the Hindus head. You know, this is the um, California textbook affair in 2006, where Hindus proposed to make new textbooks <coughs> where a number of mistakes in the earlier version would be changed. And there's nothing wrong with that, and nobody in America was against that. Only the proposal that the Hindus actually made, that with that there was something wrong. I mean, many of them were right or correct, but they put in it the claim that the Aryan invasion, uh, nobody believes in it anymore. The debate is over. Now that's not true, you see. Maybe the Aryan invasion is a mistake, but it's still very much believed. It's still in the textbook, even in India. Um, so this Michael Ritzel and together with Stanley Walker uh, intervened and they blocked this, these uh, edits, even the innocuous ones. So you see, Hindus paid heavily. They lost. Then they went again to the Board of Education, they lost again. Then they took it to court, they lost. Then they did an appeals trial, they also lost. They lost as badly as you can get, even though I've been attacked by Hindus when I say that they lost. Um, so if you don't even know the difference between victory and defeat, what are you doing on that? So you see, this was really the nadir the lowest point of the Aryan invasion. Fortunately, it's already 16 years behind. Um, so the out of India case is not heard, and the other side right now is in complete ignorance. Like I saw at the conference in Leiden this summer, you see, nobody knew what, what, what I was talking about. Because I was, of course, the only one there who represented the, uh, the out of India scenario. Um, and so all the time again, of course, it's a gap. Yeah, you see, this is Hindu, Hindu nationalism. And, you know, you being a normal person, what are you doing there? And, and all that. Um, so this is all a uh, mistake. Um, yeah, let's go over that. So uh, what happened is that uh, Stephanie Jameson, who has um, produced the most 
recent English translation of the Rig Veda is very prominent in Lotus. She commented very negatively on this book by Bryant and Chatham, bringing the two positions together. The parallel between the intelligent design issue, that is to say, Christian creation, um, and the Indo Aryan controversy are distressingly close. The Indo Aryan controversy is a manufactured one with a non scholarly agenda, and the tactics of its manufacturers are very close to those of the intelligent design proponents mentioned above. However unwittingly, and however high their aim, the two editors have sought to put a gloss of intellectual legitimacy with the sense that real science is the question they are being debated on what is essentially a religio-nationalistic attack on scholarly consensus. See? Now, this statement is flatly untrue. There should be a number of small things that I won't go into, but in the main, you see, the intelligent design theory is a conspiracy theory. Like, you see, if you find fossils of, you know, dinosaurs living hundred million years ago, for the creationists, it doesn't prove that they were dinosaurs. No, no. God, when he created the world 6,000 years ago, he also put these fossils in the ground in order to test your faith. <laughs> now, such a thing is never, <laughs> never brought up by the, the uh, out of India theory, um, and so on. And so there are also many scholars in both who just don't fit the descriptive Hindu nationalism. I am neither a Hindu nor an atheist. Moreover, you see, the theory is, is quite rational. In fact, it was believed by most Indo Europeans for about 70 years, around 1800. Then you have other homeland theories like in Anatolia um, that have been found wrong that were never ridiculed, that were never kept at a distance. They were simply discussed until they were shown to be wrong. Um, and some other arguments. So, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the organizers can send this PowerPoint to all of you. Uh, you can have that. Uh, so there's a lot of pressure against the out of India theory. Several scholars have discovered facts that actually play into the hands of the out of India theory, even though that was not their intention. And so now you get the rather comical side that very meritorious scholars like Joanna Nichols and uh, Klaus Peter Zoller um, have had to disown their own findings or have at least to disown the uh, out of India consequences, so implications of their own findings. So, you see, they claim to still stand by their own findings, but the out of India reading of those findings, that is not the You know, it's what Sri Kantala Gay has described with the influence of Stalin, where people had to recant and self-critique, public self-critique, and so on. Um, so there is enormous uh, pressure on scholars to conform to the uh, our invitation. And this is not because of racism. Racism was there, of course. Today, among scholars, it does not play anymore. Scholars being public figures, even if secretly they harbor racist ideas, would never, ever, ever publicly espouse racism. You know, the, the state religion in the West at the moment is anti-racism. Um, so, uh, Indians like to shout racism uh, for something that, in my opinion, in my impression, is this. It's a form of self-flattery. You see, if you say that the other guy is a racist, it means that he's a bad guy. And me, by contrast, I am a good guy. So it's a form of self flattery And at any rate, you see, whatever the psychological <coughs> reason behind it, it's not true. You see, it's anachronistic. <coughs> so um, 
as a parting shot to my last speech, um, I'd like to advise both the possible Westerners in the audience, certainly also the Hindus in the audience, that you really ought to familiarize yourself with the main formulation of the Out of India theory, which is the work of Sri Kantala. This is Sri Kantala really when, <coughs> when he was given, and I was present there, I was, you know, I am proud to have been present there, uh, the ceremony in the Indus University of Ahmedabad, where he was given an honorary doctor. Um, so he shows that the Rigveda remembers and even witnesses the emigration of several uh, branches of proto indo european away from the homeland India. He also shows that inside India a gradient from east to west. You see, the Vedic people came from the Ganga hill. In the oldest hymns, they treat the Ganga as a familiar feature that everybody knows. <coughs> so they came ultimately from Ayodhya, uh, Ayodhya, Dhaba, or Prayag, uh, that area, and then they went west already before the Vedic area. By the time of the Vedic area, they settled around the Saraswati River in Haryana. And then, in the later books of the Vedas, they conquered West Punjab, finally they entered Afghanistan. So this is exactly the opposite of what the Aryan invasion scenario would make you believe. And so this is evidence given by human beings, by people like us, because if you don't underestimate yourself, you are people just like me. And so in archaeology, in linguistics, in genetics, you get probabilities, you get indications, you get indirect evidence, but here you get direct evidence in the language that we understand. So See, I, I, I mean, this guy deserves a Nobel Prize. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'd like to wind up this talk with, you know, giving praise to where it belongs. Thank you.
Well, I must confess that I didn't understand well what you've seen me trying to understand. Um, <clears throat> so I have to ask someone to. Okay. No, I will uh, summarize. Yeah. At the time, there were two objections which I made. First one was that you have not explained the presence of Zaburi language in Pakistan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's one. <coughs> and the second question or point he was trying to make is that the sole evidence of Sarban's DNA, DNA is very large. It has been published in one of the great journals like Nature. Yeah. And it is there, 17 plus in Hindus have that, and also Western Europeans have that. And <coughs> the fact that we don't speak Greek like Greek uh, migrants say, it doesn't mean anything. That is what she was saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, let's start with Bravo which is your Indian language spoken in Pakistan. <coughs> So when that was discovered, um, it was that oh, this is a remnant of the Dravidian Harappa. Not exactly in that area, but close to. Though others said this is a remnant of the Dravidian movement into India from Iran. You see, this is a theory that Dravidian is related to Elamite, uh, a language spoken in southwestern Iran at the time of. And so what you can use there from is that, you know, while we're busy with, you know, theorizing invasions, why not also add a Dravidian invasion? So the Dravidians came from Iran and they ended up in South India. And there was a racial component also, uh, you know, because South India was like Africa, you see, you had people who had no writing and no buildings and nothing. And so for these more civilized people from Iran, it was very easy to overrun it. And even if they couldn't win against the Aryans, whether it's native or immigrants, at any rate, they couldn't win there. But those who moved south had it easy. And so they managed to impose the Dravidian language on the natives there. Um, there is another now far more popular theory that says that these Gravoli people were a uh, military community that was hired in the Middle Ages uh, in North India and that came from uh, South India and that the South India is simply the homeland of the Vidian for as far as we can go back. And so they have nothing in, in that theory, which is now common, they have nothing to do with, with the Harappa. They are South Indian. <coughs> Uh, so, I don't know Dravidian well to really, to really decide this question. Uh, but at any rate, it does not prove the Aryan invasion theory. You see, uh, it, it, it is an interesting thing to, to, to consider, you know, when you ask yourself where the Dravidians came from. It is there is an interesting fact, but for the Aryan story, it really makes no difference. You know, you can, you can reconcile both the Aryan invasion and the out of India scenario with the presence of the Dravidian stem. Then the second one was these uh, Aryan, Aryan kings. Well, you say that uh, it has been in, in very good journals, very good scholars have proven an Aryan invasion in 1700 BC. Well, no, you see, they have proven if, I mean, I know there are other geneticists who say that they haven't proven, but I'll admit, you know, at least for the sake of argument, that this has been proven. Okay, you see, there was an influx. This is what geneticists can do. They can show movements of human beings. So there were human <laughs> beings who came from Central Asia into India. Well, so what? You see, the Scythians have come in, the Greeks have come in, the Turks have come in, and so on, the Huns have come in, and there is no Hunnish, you know, uh, lobby group or, you know, promoting the Hunnish language in India and the Kushana culture in India and so on. 
those identities have disappeared. Even where the identity has remained, like the religious identity of Turks in, in, in India, of the Parsis in India, of the Syrian Christians in India, they still have dropped their original language and assimilated linguistically into India. So, you see, uh, there is no explanation there of why it should have gone differently with the Aryans. You see, the Aryans were in a very poor position. When the Greeks came into India, at least, you see, they had their, their Greek culture with them. They had a whole history of con conquest, of Hellenizing <coughs> the populations they conquered and so on. They could have Greecicized India if, if history had gone a little different, but they haven't, you see. Now, these people coming on horseback or however from Central Asia, these barbarians, you know, how possibly could they impose their language, their culture, their religion on a far more numerous and far more advanced Indian population? So, and then, most decisive answer. You see, yes, they saw uh, an immigration, but you say that they saw an Aryan immigration. You see, this summer I talked several times with this gay man. Very intelligent man. You see, I trust his findings in genetics, it is not my field, but you see, the way he argues is all very convincing. Yes, there clearly was an immigration around 1700. Okay, but it was not the Aryan immigration. Maybe those people spoke an Indo European language. Scythian, you know, is Iranian an Indo European language. Greek is an Indo European language. Tocharian, you know, spoken by the Kushan, is an Indo European language. Hunnish or Turkish is not. So both scenarios are possible. Um, but we don't know what language they spoke, you see. But we do know that it was not a Vedic Sanskrit, because the Vedic Sanskrit had been inside <coughs> India for at least 1500 years earlier. So, you know, whatever migration there was, it was not the Vedic people. <coughs> Excuse me? Uh, so, if anybody wants to ask, okay. ask a question, please raise their hands and we'll give them the mic. Uh, 
Yeah, well, I think I have already mentioned uh, some contributions from those sciences. <coughs> like astronomy is very important in showing the higher chronology of the phasers as opposed to that of the uh, uh, RNA basin theory. You see, there is absolutely no one uh, astronomical given that supports the chronology of Maxwell. Not one. You see, they are all common versions. This means that a text known to be older than another text will never have an astronomical indication younger than one given in that text. Okay? So the, 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 the known literary relative chronology matches the absolute astronomical chronology. And so it clearly points to a more ancient time than uh, accepted in the RNA basis theory. Uh, then uh, a kind of uh, non linguistic evidence that was used in the 19th century was the literary evidence of the Rig Veda. And so at that time, the, the Rig Veda was a bit uh, distorted into giving uh, testimony of an argument. And you know, then that went sort of out of use. Everybody by then had assumed the conclusions of that theory. You see, that theory itself was not much talked about anymore. You know, it's now, you know, with the anti-racist atmosphere, it's a bit delicate to speak about, you know, racial discrimination by the Vedic people, or then again, it can also be very, uh, very vogueish, namely when you say that the Aryans are the bad guys, um, you know, there is a premium of indigenousness. Uh, but at any rate, you see that that is, very rarely mentioned publicly, um, and these new translations tend to uh, reproduce the old translations, um, but not entirely. Like you see, I discussed this with one of the leading European scholars at the moment, uh, Martin Kummel, in uh, both in Leiden and then in Berlin. There was another conference. And he remarked, well, you see, today they don't say anymore that the Aryans came <coughs> against the black Aboriginals. And I thought, this is simply not true. At the time of the David Rice controversy here in India, I read dozens of times in all kinds of Indian sources uh, that the black Aboriginals had to defend themselves against the Aryan invaders. So, so, you know, the, that idea is still very alive. I also hear it from Westerners on social media and so on. However, it is true, I checked it and I was surprised to find it, that in this uh, youngest Veda translation by uh, Stephanie Jameson and Joel Brereton, um, they do make it a point to say that the, the word black used in the description of the Battle of the Ten Kings does not refer to skin color. They miss the, the information that black, in this case, refers to the Black River, to the western origin of the <coughs> rather than the southeastern of the aboriginals. But at least they admit, you see, that it's not skin color. You know, it's so brief because you see these racial categories that go very touchy these days. They want to get away from that, and they do. So it's a fact that uh, here they are more careful, where the 19th century people just readily uh, took this, this confrontation to be racial. Um, so that's, uh, that's uh, an evolution in the right direction. But we are not there yet. You see, uh, fundamentally, uh, all, this, all the controversial elements in those translations supported the Aryan invasion scenario. And so that result, that conclusion in favor of the Aryan invasion, that is still with them. And you see, most of them nowadays don't know or don't realize the earlier history of how the uh, 
uh, our innovation scenario came into being. Uh, like, for instance, the, the, all these people who say, oh, it was an internationalist concoction. Now, first of all, it was not a concoction, but they don't know the, the art of India scenario, and they know usually nothing at all about Indian politics. But it's not just a matter of concoction, it's a matter that they situated in the circles of Hindu nationalism. When in reality, everybody who knows the story of how the Indo-European theory came into being ought to know that it was a uh, European originated theory. And that European first those living in India, but then all the Europeans who took an interest in it accepted the art of India scenario. And so it had nothing to do with Hindu nationalism. There was no conscious Hindu nationalist movement at the time, and it was not involved with this very European debate. Right? So, so in, that, in that sense, you see, the mistakes made in the 19th century are still with us, or are still having an effect, though often not most realized, by the people who voice the, the argumentation. literary support in Latin, uh, in the support of out of India theory. Hmm? Is there any literary evidence in Latin? In Latin. In Latin. No. no. It's not quite. No. Um, what you do find in Latin about their origin, uh, there is a story which may have a historical basis, but it's only a story. Um, Namely, that they came from Troy. You see, that one of the princes of Troy, after Troy was, uh, was ransacked, he escaped. Then he went to Carthage, present day Tunisia, where he had a love affair with the queen, Guido. Then he moved on, and then in central Italy, he founded his new colony, and that's where Rome uh, origin. And so Romans at the time, wealthy Romans that could afford to travel, they traveled all the way to Troy, in what is now Turkey, to just you know pay or uh, uh, you know uh, praise or something to their ancestors, to whom they thought to be their ancestors. But beyond that, it doesn't really go. <coughs> so I don't think that the Romans contributed to our knowledge. But you know, here I mean. I keep on discovering things all the time, so maybe there is something, but I don't know. Yeah, so I had two questions. One was, you mentioned, you mentioned that R is the word R is in original writing, early writing, is in the sense of a people, mm -hmm. right? Us. Yeah. But when you look at the references in the big data, the word I comes maybe 30, 35 times. Okay. But there is not one reference in which it is used in that sense. I, I disagree. No, no, no. Then you have to cite. <laughs> I, you can disagree. I respect your uh, Yeah. You have to cite one the second question. Yeah. I will say. Because this whole debate is constructed around this term I. A lot of this goes around this term I. That is one thing. The second question is, you mentioned about proto indo european <coughs> And it has been argued that, oh, because I exist, so my mother existed, so my grandmother existed. That is a reasonable argument. But there is a lot of proof that my grandmother existed. Right? There is Every linguist, and you yourself have said this when you gave your presentation, that there is no evidence of the existence of proto Indo European. There is no evidence for the existence of proto Indo European. People have reconstructed, but they have reconstructed mm -hmm. based on no data. And a very important point in that context is because I am not a scholar in this area like you are, 
But they say, oh, for instance, in this sa and ha, if sa gets transmitted as ha and so on and so forth, this is all based on oral understanding of the word. There is no oral data across the world for science <coughs> as remote as that, except for Vedic Sanskrit. Because we know that Vedic Sanskrit has been trans uh, transmitted over thousands of years, mm. probably as is. But besides that, there is zero uh, oral data, which, you know, acoustic data, based on which we can make these mm. inferences. So, it is a speculation, I will respect that speculation, but I do not know whether it can be actually said that, oh yeah, PIP really existed. It may be that there may be several in the world, uh, you know, several PIPs. It could be, it could be Sanskrit, it could be, there could be two versions of PIP, but we just do not know what the reality was. That's all I say. Okay. Well, um, you know, I don't know the references by heart or the number, uh, but in, you know, I advise everyone to read Talagdi. He gives the whole list, you know, with the exact references, number, and verse. Um, and so, you know, they don't have to say it explicitly. You can see how they use the word. <coughs> that is how they treat it. the Paurava in the area, and a non Paurava is not an you can see that logic, you know, operating all this time. Now, how it came to have the meaning in Hosu, uh, first of all, it partly had that meaning since the beginning, in the sense that in a tribe, you see, those who are really part of the tribe, they are all related to one another, and then you have like hangers on. You see, people who have lost their own tribe or who have been thrown out or so, and they come and ask you, oh, can I get a job or something? And, and, and then they get protection because they become part of the tribe and so on. But they're not the real ones. And so in that sense, you know, Arya means us, but it also means specifically us who really belong here as opposed to these hangers on, as opposed to these immigrants. Um, so partly it has this meaning already of elite, since the beginning. But then later, you see what happens. You, you can see it in the Battle of the Ten Kings, they chase the Lady Iranian. You know, the Alnavas or the enemies, or the Dasa. Dasa meaning people. You see, they lose the battle. Now, what happens is that the elite of the Iranians, either they get killed in the battle, or they flee to Afghanistan. So that the next battle actually takes place in Afghanistan and the village people don't really lose, but don't really win. And so that's where their expansion ends. So from that time on, you get a nice division, you know, good fences make good neighbors. So the mountains there, the, the, what is later called the Hindu Kush, at that time called the, uh, what is it, Upari uh, Siena, the meaning the mountains, you know, higher than where the eagle flies, um, uh, form a nice border and so on one side you have the Iranian, on the other you have the Indian, and after that they become friends. In the later books of the Veda, this enmity with the Iranians is gone, and so some of the patrons of the Vedic rishis are Iranian. Um, but then what happens is that the Arabian common people stay behind in Punjab. They are Dasas, just like the elites who have left. Um, and uh, so the elites who have left, we find them in Greek or Roman sources as the Dai. You see, the Arabians are the Dai, that is to say the Dasas. Um, and so at that point, there is no lowly connotation. The, the lower class, the Dasas, none of this is an ethnic term. But you see what happens in India is that it's only the lower class that remains behind. And they are still called Dasas. And so from that point on, Dasa in India gets the connotation of service class. And that's why Das is, is then also used commonly as, as the family name or the, the second name of, of Shudra, of people of the lower classes. 
And so in contrast to that area, meaning the real Vedic people, <coughs> not the non-Vedic people who are now our servants. Uh, you see there, that gets the connotation of noble, upper class and so on. And then you get the same evolution that you find in English. Noble, the word noble, now mostly is used in the term of some moral quality, being generous. Uh, and uh, originally it had a sociological quality. It meant upper class. It meant part of the aristocracy. And so in India you get the same thing. Arya means upper class or upper caste, like Arya are the Vedic people who have the Vedic initiation, which is only given to the upper caste. And so the contrast, Arya, upper caste, aristocratic, Dasa, lower caste. And so that's how it came about. You see, many people will say, yeah, but this is the meaning of Arya. No, you see, everything has a history. And so this meaning of Arya and of Dasa has evolved and has an identifi identifiable cause. Same with Asura, for example. Asura does not mean demon. Asura means god or a particular category of gods, like in Germanic. Aesir are the Asuras, meaning the gods. And um, so this word originally refers to the Iranian. You see, they worship an Asura, namely Varuna, under the title Ahura Mazda, wise lord, or wise, you know, wise powerful one. Um, and so there the meaning shifts because for a while, for a few generations, the Iranians are the enemy, and so the word Asura, just like Dasa, gets a negative connotation. And then that remains with the word Asura. Consider the recitation of the Vedas today 
as a tape recording of the recitation of the Vedas four thousand years. Yeah, so that's a very impressive achievement, absolutely. Um, so we we don't have Indo-European, but we have something very close. The, the, that sentence is the closest we get to Indo-European, like you see, I, I give you a classical example. Um, in Vedic Sanskrit, you have eight cases to the noun and three numbers uh, singular, plural, but also plural, with these using most longer languages. Um, so, uh, and you can find remains of those cases or of those numbers in, for instance, Greek and Latin. Like the word doni in Latin, at home, herper, okay? That is a locative case, though in most words in Latin, the locative case has been lost. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's not difficult to accept that uh, uh, Sanskrit is the closest to the construction. Now, what we don't know is exactly what Indo-European looked like, and that's the business of the Indo-Europeanist, to get as close to it as possible, to reconstruct it as perfectly as possible, and to all the data from the daughter languages can contribute. Um, I don't think anybody who is uh, accomplished in the science will say, we know what Indo-European looked like, but we can get ever closer to it. I know that on social media especially, you find some junior scholars of the European who pretend that they know it all and it has to be exactly like this and not a little bit different. You see, that's a false certainty. So we know that in this, like in all historical sciences, we can approximate what reality really was, not much more in most cases. Um, it's like uh, the, the father of modern historical science, uh, Leopold uh, uh, Ranke, said uh, we have to reconstruct things as they really have been. So that's an ideal. Uh, sometimes you can get there, sometimes you find documents that really prove what happened. Mostly you can only approximate. So you see, did Napoleon exist? Well, he's not there anymore, we can't verify it. But we have all kinds of documents that refer to him. Everything put together greatly suggests that he exists. But yes, we do not always know. And, and, and so, in the case of this reconstruction, also it is only an approximation. I have absolutely no problem uh, making that. I'm in no hurry. I perfectly respect the agenda of the organizers, but don't blame me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, don't blame me. Yeah, yeah. Last, last question. <laughs> uh, if I'm not mistaken, I got the feeling that you seem to conflate the two words singular and plural. Is that the case? I mean, well, I mean, <laughs> you see, invaders are immigrants, that's for sure. They start outside and they end up inside. So invaders are a subcategory of immigrants. And invaders um, are those who uh, do not adapt to the, the culture they find locally, nor who impose their own original culture. That's the difference between invaders and other immigrants. Some, some rightists in England are exactly saying that, yes. <laughs> so, but you see, they are lucky with Rishi Sunak. You know, he, he looks like a good guy. And um, in fact, he's very welcome. You know, the Conservative Party welcomes him as a savior. The savior of the party itself, which was totally falling apart. The savior of the British economy which was neglected or treated very shoddily by Boris Johnson, which was positively harmed enormously by Liz Truss. Whereas he, you see, he has a level-headed man, he has both his on the ground, etc. 
same kind of dynamic is going to undertake things in British uh, economy. So he's not going to do anything foolish. At the same time, he's not going to be like a daisy cook, you know. So I mean, he, he really has the right profile. Then his influence is, is really the right kind. You see, he's not some fanatic. He's not some, you know, off the wall, uh, far fetched. But at the same time, he is very, very consciously Hindu. You see, he wears his Hinduness on his sleeve. He does Hindu rituals and so on. Um, so, you know, it's just the best you could hope for. Now here, you see, I, I know that I shouldn't make predictions. Maybe, you know, in a few years, it'll be crazy and disappointing. But I really don't expect that. And so at the moment, I'm very happy that it's he who became the Prime Minister. Uh, if I may. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. So maybe, maybe later on. Let's, maybe let us just close this and we can uh, have this. Would, would you have time after this? Yes. All right. You will have time. You will have time. Okay. So uh, on that happy note of the outer media, at least <coughs> the Prime Minister is the kind of yeah. And of course, people, uh, I mean, highlight England. But there were these uh, uh, instances in Ireland and Portugal as well. But anyway, so we have this book of Portuguese history. So thank you for that. And uh, so I thank you again. I thank the uh, well, the two volunteers, the George office for facilitating all of this. Of course, I thank the uh, speaker and the audience for staying so late and still not spending enough time to have all the questions. So thank you all, and uh, we'll see.